very much for that uh, introduction that uh, I think precedes me. I hope my presentation will lead up to it. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, like you mentioned, my name is Suleiman Brunga, and uh, I'm here to take you through a brief presentation on why, uh, personally, we uh, believe cryptocurrency or digital assets should be considered as an asset class. And actually, first of all, asset class. Uh, they have quite a bit of uh, reputation globally, but uh, over time, people have come to realize that uh, this is a technology that is here to stay and is here to impact the world uh, across the scale from the financial industry to every other industry uh, that people interact with. So just a brief introduction again. Um, I'm a director at a company called Muda. Uh, we are a Pan-African digital asset exchange. We do cross-border payments, and we enable people to access cryptocurrency and other digital assets. We have a presence across several African markets, uh, Dubai and Asia, and we process north of $100 million in uh, trading volume. What I'd like to start off with is, uh, before I get into why we believe cryptocurrency is uh, an investable asset class, or should be considered as an asset, is we have to look at what makes it an asset. And I can only do that by briefly explaining what blockchain technology is, because blockchain technology is the underlying technology behind any digital asset, any cryptocurrency. All cryptocurrencies and all digital assets are based on blockchain technology. And a blockchain, in simple terms, is an online distributed system that stores information, right? And this differs from traditional databases because when you store information digitally, you're storing this information in a database. But Previously, we've been utilizing centralized databases. A centralized database is what has been running our financial industry since we digitized it. Mobile money, banking, and all other fintechs, traditional fintechs use centralized databases. And with a centralized database, it means that there is a central point of failure. There is a central point that controls this system. It means that if I have my account with that entity. That entity has a right to give me permission to use that system, block my permission to use that system, or they can edit it as they will because they have con full control over this system. What revolutionizes blockchain technology is that this database is distributed across all the participants. So it is decentralized, which means there is no single point of failure, there is no single entity that controls the network. There's no single entity that controls the information. Why is this important? This is important because when two parties are transacting in a blockchain, and which makes it different from when two parties are transacting in a centralized database, it means it, the difference is that when two parties are transacting in a blockchain, when, when one party wants to transact with another party, they're transacting directly with each other. When one party wants to transact with another party in a centralized database, they're transacting through the centralized entity. If I want to send you mobile money, I am not sending you directly that mobile money. I am instructing MTN to debit my account and credit your account. If MTN does not uh, do that function, no transaction can occur. But with a blockchain, I am transacting directly with you. The whole network is just there to confirm that transaction. And I'll just take you uh, briefly through how that transaction occurs. So here yeah, I have a brief uh, example where I have uh, the red triangle trying to transact with an orange triangle. So I'll say party A trying to transact with party B. What will happen is that party A will request to carry out the transaction and like I mentioned, the blockchain is a network, so all the participants on that network have access to this database. So when party A requests to transact with party B, party A will uh, 
puts out that that request, it will be broadcasted to the entire network. So the network of computers will check does party A have enough funds to transact with party B. If party A does have enough funds to transact with party B, then, party, then the transaction will be verified, accepted by the network, and a block will be created. So they say blockchain, right? So the blockchain is a network of blocks. If a transaction occurs within a certain period, all the transactions within that period will be congregated into a block of information and added to the database. So once that transaction has been, of, has been accepted, for example, if a block is created every 10 minutes, it will be added into a block which will constitute all the transactions within that 10 minute period. A block will be created, right, and added to the blockchain. So the blockchain is, is the database consisting of all the transactions that have occurred since the beginning of that blockchain. Once the block is created and added to the blockchain, so the list of, 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 of information, then the transaction will be completed and the funds will move from party A's account to party B. Right? And at that point, whereas in a centralized database, or for example, mobile money, once a transaction has been completed between me and another party, once the transaction has been completed and successful, MTN updates its, its database. In a blockchain, because there is no single MTN, it's everyone who is in the network. At that point, once the transaction has been completed, everyone's transact, everyone's database will be updated with a new status, which is funds have moved from party A to party B, and that will be the new status of the entire network. That party A no longer has the funds, party B has them. Why is this important? This is important because if everybody has that information within their own database, within their own possession, it means that no single party can create a false entry. And if no single party can create a false entry, it means that you cannot create fake funds or duplicate funds. And a blockchain is not only limited to storing funds or, or value in, in regards to financial data. It can also be used to, to, to store land titles, can be used to store art, can be used to store real estate, can be used to store medical records. So if we now have a system that no single party can manipulate, at that point you then realize that we have created the digital scarcity. And if you have digital scarcity, that can then be, it can then be interpreted as a commodity. It then becomes a commodity. Because if I create a blockchain, and in that blockchain, I set the rules as there are only going to be a limited number of tokens, or coins, or units, one million units, and these units have a demand. And this demand has limited supply. It means that if I put these units on a marketplace, then that marketplace is going to have to distribute those units. And the only way to efficiently distribute those units, if they are fungible, is through pricing. And that is why cryptocurrencies have a price. Because people are always asking, why is Bitcoin worth $20,000? Why is cryptocurrency worth this? And that is exactly the reason. Because they are fungible, they are limited in supply, they have demand, and they need to be distributed. And that distribution is being done through a marketplace. So, to summarize what a blockchain is, in regards to their characteristics, it is transparent because all the participants have access to the database. Anyone today can go to the Bitcoin network, for example, download the entire database on their computer and see all the transactions from the beginning of when it was released to date. 
So if someone wants to transact with you on that network, you just have access to their address or their wallet and you can check yourself as this person how much is claiming, are they trying to cheat me, are they the owner? And then you can if you can hey, choose whether to transact with them or not. So you do not need to trust the other party, you just need to trust the network, so the network has not been compromised. And to date, the Bitcoin network has never been compromised and there are very many other blockchains. It is immutable. So because the network is not in a central point, it is distributed across millions of computers, it means no one can change that data. If you change it on your own computer, the other computers around the world will not sync with your copy because you have to have consensus. And consensus means majority of the network has to agree with you. It is borderless. So the reason why cryptocurrencies are used or are now gaining traction for in the financial world for for use for storing value, um, transacting globally, and uh, doing various financial services because they can be they can be related to if you look at messaging, SMS versus WhatsApp. If I'm sending you a WhatsApp, as far as WhatsApp is concerned, it doesn't care whether the other person I'm sending a message is in the room or they're in China or Alaska. It's going to take the same amount of time, it's going to cost the same amount. Whereas if I'm sending you an SMS, the cost of sending you an SMS in Uganda is cost of sending someone SMS in, 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 in China or wherever is different. So with blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies, because they are internet based, then it revolutionizes finance like that. So me sending someone crypto in China or me sending someone crypto in Uganda is exactly the same cost at the same time. So that creates a whole new realm when it comes to financial services. It is secure, no single point of failure, and it is decentralized. So you can have a decentralized network for those who require that. And with that, there are those, there are two different types. There is permissioned networks where it is closed system between trusted parties or permissionless, which is completely open and anyone can join that. So, we now get to the main, main point of this presentation. Digital assets as an investment vehicle or as an asset class. Now, from the advent of cryptocurrencies, various uh, applications have been implemented, and some of them are scaling rapidly. And uh, when you look at the first successful implementation, it was a currency. So Bitcoin was made to less of a currency. We also have a dollar denominated coin called USDT, which is pegged to the US dollar one to one. One coin equals to one dollar, and it's now being used for global currency transactions, payments between uh, various current countries. People are now using moving money through that because it's more efficient in the banking system. If I'm to use that, I can have my money to buy $10 million in Dubai in the next five minutes and liquidated um, with very little slippage. So the first thing is cryptocurrency now being used as a medium of exchange. And uh, because the units are fungible, people are pricing things. So you need to you need to account. And uh, once they gain stability in, in the pricing, then you will start seeing more of that coming to, to, into play. We also have cryptocurrencies being used as a utility asset. This means that, that you have a cryptocurrency representing a network. So just like how you have uh, shares in a company, if I own this cryptocurrency, then I own a stake in this network. So the, the, the more valuable the stake or the network becomes, the more valuable my cryptocurrency becomes, right? And we're in a digital age. Everything is becoming digital. So more and more people are looking towards digital assets 
or digital means to invest their, their time to invest their money. And cryptocurrencies, uh, blockchains, are uh, becoming very popular because of what they represent, network effects. Network effects uh, are a new phenomenon and they are rapidly gaining value and rapidly locking value within the largest network. So for example, WhatsApp, the reason why more people will use WhatsApp and everyone else wants to message will come onto WhatsApp is because of the network effects it has gotten. You are more likely to find people who you know using WhatsApp than you don't. And so it's more attractive for you to use WhatsApp than any other network. And so this is what cryptocurrencies uh, gain value on. And the last one is security. Digital assets, because of the structure of a blockchain, it is a distributed network that stores information. Simply a ledger, right? It means that it can be used, and there are some pilots taking place around the world, for example, in Dubai, uh, where the capital markets is looking at how to digitize their distribution, ownership of, of, of securities, distribution of securities, exchange of securities using blockchain technology, right? We can now have securities or representation of companies on the blockchain and efficiently have those distributed. The other day I saw someone posting on Twitter that they received their dividends from CIPLA, 4,300 shillings, and then 3,500 shillings was deducted by the bank, so then they got 1,000 shillings. <laughs> With cryptocurrencies, that can never happen because the transaction, the cost of transacting on a blockchain is almost nil. So if you have your securities distributed on a, on a blockchain and everyone can be easily identified, it means also the dividends can be distributed on the blockchain at nil cost and everyone will receive their, their dividends on time without any errors, and if they want to be liquidated, they can easily be liquidated. So, cryptocurrencies and blockchain technologies or digital assets are a very new asset class. Because now we've established that there are, there are members of the community, of the global community, who are now looking at this as an asset class. So if they're looking at this as an asset class, it means that I will compare this and I will approach this like I'm approaching every other asset class that I need to distribute my funds into, right? And the reason why people find cryptocurrencies or digital assets exciting is because of the fact that they are still a small boat in the ocean. They're not just a, a, a cruise liner. And when you look at them in comparison to the other traditional asset classes that we've been investing in, for example, gold or precious metals, global stock, stocks, and uh, cash globally, they are still very tiny, extremely tiny, which means there's a lot of room for growth. Gold has a, has a market cap of $12.5 trillion, global stocks have a market cap of $99 trillion, and cash globally has a market cap of $105 trillion. Cryptocurrencies have a market cap, all of them combined both the legitimate ones and the scams of just less than a billion dollars. So it means that if I'm seated here as someone who's looking to make a long-term investment, and I look at the trend of our civilization, just from a macro perspective, what is happening? Software is eating the world. This generation, the, the, the young ones right now are Digital, everything they're doing, Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, etc. All their all their dream, all their photos, all their activities are all online. It means that they are also going to put their money online. And the only way to do that securely and safely is through blockchain technology. So I can make a simple as simple assessment and say, you know what? I think five percent of money over the next ten years is going to move from these other traditional assets and go there. 
So if I possess most of global cash, global stocks, gold, and it pushes digital assets to the same level as gold, it means that in five years I'm looking at an easy 10x growth in my investment. Just the mere fact that some people are going to inherit, this is the uh, Instagram generation, so if I inherit, I'm going to put my money in that, and the supply is limited, so if the supply is limited, then there's only one way the price can go. So this is why people are excited about this space. It's still small, it makes sense from a technological perspective, and it's in line with the global trends. Another reason why people now, from the more regulated side of things, hedge funds, treasury managers, investors, are now seriously looking at cryptocurrencies because if you look at the trend over the last 10 years, they have, on average, performed extremely well in comparison to the other alternatives. Yeah, there are some years where cryptocurrency has had some, some pretty poor returns, but if someone is to couple it in a three-year, three-year period, you will see that the people invested in, 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 for example, Bitcoin, have fared much better than people invested in traditional things like S&P 500 or precious metals, gold, or the NSC. So a lot of people are now taking the position that, you know what, maybe we put in 2%, 3%, or up to 5% of our funds into cryptocurrency assets. The downside, if it goes to zero, we lose 5%. The upside, if it works out, that 5% becomes 30-40% of our entire portfolio. So the numbers are in, numbers don't lie, and so this is why people are taking this much more seriously. So how are people um, getting access or exposure to this asset class? Because there are different types of investors. You have some that are on the extreme end, highly regulated, not only by governments, but also their boards and their company structures, and then others who are free to do things on an individual level. There are three main ways people are doing this. One, direct exposure, so buying the cryptocurrency directly, which is risky and requires a lot of time and attention. And if someone is not willing to put in the time to educate themselves, one, and then manage these things actively, I would recommend that at this point in time, but there, 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 there are some big companies that have done this. For example, uh, Tesla put a portion of their company funds uh, into their company reserves into Bitcoin and bought $1 billion worth of Bitcoin. But that is an extremely large company, so $1 billion is, maybe I think Tesla is now at a trillion dollars, $1 billion is, 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 is extremely small to them, but there is precedence where a board sat down and said, this is something to believe in. Uh, another way for companies to, or entities to get exposure is through ETFs, exchange traded funds. And uh, there are some institutions that have really launched some. For example, Canada, we have some cryptocurrency ETFs and uh, they are working well and uh, they are giving people that opportunity to get access to that. And the last way is through the stock market, through the capital markets. And no, you're not going to find Bitcoin on the capital markets or in the stock exchange, but you will find companies who have 75% or more of their revenues coming from cryptocurrency related activities. And so this is how traditional investment entities 
are finding ways to get exposure. So companies like MicroStrategy or Coinbase, which is a big exchange, are some of the entities that companies are looking to enter this space through.